Think about that the inside of the gut, so we're talking about the intestinal barrier here, the inside of the gut is outside of us. So until information moves from the bacterial gut microbiome into us, it's still outside of us. So we separate, we're separated from the contents of the gut by the intestinal barrier. So now what we're going to talk about briefly is what are the factors involved in the health of the gut. So that intestinal barrier ain't very big. It's a single line of mucosal cells uh, separating the inside of the gut from the blood. All right? And <clears throat> the job of that single mucosal barrier, mucosal cells, is to protect us against invasions of microorganisms and toxins. We need to make sure we don't lose too much water, and we need to make sure we're absorbing water and nutrients. It's got a lot of work to do. A disturbance in the gut microbiome biota homeostasis due to an imbalance in the flora itself, changes in their functional composition and metabolic activities, or changes in their local distribution. This is the definition of dysbiosis, okay? An imbalance in the flora. Loss of beneficial organisms, overgrowth of pathogens, loss of overall diversity. So the etiologies, we can see stress, okay? Where else have we seen stress? We see stress causing direct damage to neurons in the central nervous system, okay? Stress also disrupts the gut-blood-brain barrier, another piece of the problem going on with inflammation in the central nervous system. Medications, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. 75% of people who are chronically on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories will develop ulcerations in their intestinal tract. The hell with the stomach, all right? Relatively small number of people develop ulcerations in the stomach itself. 75% are developing it within the gut. That's going to create massive problems with the gut, the, the gut blood barrier. All right, opioids, we've already talked about. Antibiotics, obviously because of the disruption uh, of the gut microbiome. Diets, high in fat, high in sugar, high in fructose, high in gluten, high in alcohol, sometimes referred to as the standard American diet. All of this will create problems in dysbiosis. Environmental toxins, pesticides, mercury, BPAs from plastics. We've got a lot of ways that we figured out how to poison ourselves. Infections, viruses, bacteria. Think about people who have come back from going to the Caribbean, going to Mexico and other countries, have developed a gastrointestinal infection and have been sick ever since. Even though you got rid of the giardiasis, even though you got rid of the entamoeba histolytica. Because again, we treated a piece of it, but we never treated all the downstream effects. The gut dysbiosis that subs subsequently occurs and the problems that then occur with inflammation in the central nervous system. So all of a sudden, this problem that started with Torista now becomes sleep disturbances, chronic headaches, chronic pain, but if you don't take the history, you don't get that piece of information. So you've got to go back and say, let's take it from the beginning and figure out all of the pieces that have contributed to you ending up in our office today. Now the other interesting piece of this is you can also use this in prevention. So that if you're thinking in this way and you're thinking that cumulative assaults on the system ultimately can result in chronic disease, then what you have the opportunity to do is screen people ahead of time, unburden them from these conditions, balance the gut microbiota, and prevent the occurrence of some diseases. So it's not just about treating people after they've gotten sick, it's about how do we keep them healthy. And one of the things that's been so brilliant about the work we do in treating very sick people is we've actually learned a lot about how to keep people healthy and prevent them from getting sick in the first place. Genetics clearly plays a role here, why different people are susceptible to different things. By the way, one of the other stressors that comes into play is disruption of the circadian rhythm. So if you're staying up all night long, if you're not getting adequate sleep, if you're waking up multiple times during the night, if your sleep patterns are all over the place, going to bed at 4 in the morning one day, going to bed at 9 o'clock the next, all of this really screws up the gut microbiome. All right, and the end result is lots of problems that can come out on the other end. Again, looking at this, we see problems where we see food intolerances and 
disruption of the blood-brain barrier. Food intolerance is one of the things. You see these people who have, I'm allergic to everything, all right? We have a couple of people that we have to prescribe Himalayan air, harvested at 8,000 foot is all they can have because they're allergic to everything in sight, all right? It's stupid that you're allergic to everything in sight. You're not. What you are is you've got a significant problem with the, with the gut blood barrier. And what happens is there are these tight junctions which, when they get opened up, allow large molecules to penetrate into the bloodstream. The body does not like large molecules. It looks at a large molecule and says, that is an antigen and I will make an antibody to that. And so you have to stop eating that because now you've got an antibody reaction, an allergic reaction going on. What we need to do is go back and seal the gut. We seal the gut and then what can happen over the next several months is those antibodies will clear. How do I know they're clear? Because if I look at celiac patients and I take them off gluten, within three months, typically, sometimes as long as six, as long as they're not re-exposed to gluten, they will clear all of their antibodies. Does that mean they no longer have celiac disease? Absolutely not. But it means they no longer have the antibodies. So in other conditions, where in fact we don't have true allergies but they occurred as a result of overexposure if you will. If we take those foods away we can at one point gradually add them back in and see how you respond. So you're not doomed for life to have all of these different uh, sensitivities. So there's a lot that we can do and must do in terms of understanding the health of the gut and how to repair the gut. And again, we see a whole list of symptoms which we've now been able to identify in studies that are, in fact, associated with disruptions of the gut microbiome, inclusive of increased cardiovascular risk. So again, understanding this stuff is also about understanding prevention. It's not just about treating disease. It's about understanding that disease isn't an event, but cumulative process over time, and we can intervene before it expresses if we know where to go look and if we know what to do. So now the picture, the map, if you will, of chronic pain is mast cells, involves treatment of microglia and astrocytes. But now we have to factor in the gut. We have to factor in the peripheral con contributions to pain as well. As I said, that's for another lecture. That's the down-up phenomenon. But the reality of the matter is We've got to deal with these and these and these are our targets. So now we have a really valuable piece of information. We know where to go look. We know how to start the process of repairing people. Because now we're not looking at the part that hurts. We're looking at a neuroinflammatory process and we're understanding how the brain got inflamed and what we can do in order to quiet that down. It's a whole new way of looking at this, a whole new ballgame. 